for watching Chili Boy Productions. I'm Larry Chili Boy Chilson, and this is my interview with writer director Wes Hurley. In anticipation for his film, Potato Dreams of America, being released to special edition Blu-ray by Vinegar Syndrome in collaboration with Dark Star Pictures, I sat down with the LGBTQ Russian native to discuss his latest feature. I hope you enjoy this interesting discussion with an independent filmmaker from within the LGBTQIA community. And ultimately, I hope this inspires you to seek out his new film, Potato Dreams of America, now available to rent on all major VOD platforms. And of course, available June 21st to purchase through vinegarsyndrome.com. Now, let's get to the interview. Well, I'm here today speaking with Wes Hurley, writer and director of Potato Dreams of America, a LGBTQ coming of age film that also serves as an autobiographical, fantastical type of drama, I would say. Hi, Wes. Thank you for sitting down and speaking with me today. Hi. Thank you for having me. Yeah. <laughs> well, this film is kind of a spin-off of sorts of a short film you had released a couple of years back called Little Potato. And from what I had read, what I had seen, that actually was more of a side project as you were always hoping to make this film here. Is that correct? Yes, I wrote the script for the feature about eight years ago and then um, you know, it's a struggle to make an indie feature, so um, halfway through that process of trying to raise money and stuff, I made a short doc, which basically covers the same story, but in a documentary format. And it certainly is a story, a very unique <laughs> and interesting story that I'm glad you had the opportunity to tell. Speaking on how interesting the story is, what was your thought process in making this more dreamlike fantastical telling of your story rather than a more straightforward biopic style format yeah i mean uh the dreamy kind of surreal style of the film i think it's the reason is twofold you know one is i really the the first half of the film takes place in russia uh and it's the years when i was a little kid and i really like magical realism and coming of age stories because I feel like they capture that sort of sense of wonder and magic that you have as a child. Everything feels very bigger than life and uh, over the top. Um, I feel like, especially with gay kids, <laughs> you know, there's like more drama than the, you know. <laughs> and so I wanted it to be visually feel like a dream, almost like a child's memory of a place and a time. Go with that, you know, telling the story on a really tiny budget. This is te technically, it's like a period film because it takes place in the 80s in the Soviet Union and then in the 90s in Seattle. And so making a period film with uh, a really small budget, I kind of wanted to embrace the fact that it is a, you know, this is a film. This is a, in, you know, in some ways, low budget film and embrace that kind of John Waters, you know, DIY aesthetic of it, but still make it really beautiful to look at, but kind of whimsical. And there's no um, pretense that this is realism, that this is like, <laughs> you know, that this is yeah. just like real life. Particularly, how did the Jonathan Bennett fabulous Jesus work his way into the script? <laughs> <laughs> Our casting agent in New York uh, pitched uh, Jonathan to us, and I, I just got really excited because, of course, you know, he's so iconic with his, uh, you know, especially with the main girl's role. Um, and I thought it would be funny, you know, we had a, the first time I met Jonathan, he asked me, he's like, well, the this imaginary Jesus is really part of your mind, and you're gay, so this Jesus is gay. And I was like, I, I think you're right. <laughs> so... <laughs> 
So he played this Jesus as a very gay kind of flamboyant Jesus. Like you could see him on RuPaul's Drag Race being a judge or something. Well, when you are setting the film, the first half or so, over in Russia, certainly the first act, how come you decided to keep that part still in English rather than have it spoken in Russian with English subtitles and then transition over as we move to America? Yeah, that was really, really important for me to make it that way because I wanted um, people to see the part in Russia and not think about the language in the same way that you would see like a, a Chekhov's play on stage in America and not think about the language. And then to have this really jarring, jolting um, transition when they are in the States and it's suddenly this fish out of water feeling that all immigrants have when you come to the country, you don't speak the language. Yeah. And it's all of a sudden you're like a child again. Um, you know, and I saw that with myself. I saw that with my mom when we moved. You know, my mom was like this super educated, like acid tongue doctor, like super, you know, very well rounded. Suddenly she's like a little kid, you know, because her English is limited. And suddenly in the stage, she's like a little kid. And so that was really important for me to capture that that intensity of transition with the language and i thought that was the way for me to do it for maybe audiences who haven't had that experience themselves to just really pay attention to how that affects your life well you mentioned more so in the documentary some of the films that you and your mother loved you both kind of bounced back and forth in that one uh, listing off films a love of whoopi goldberg is mentioned what are some of those films that really got you into movies yeah i mean you know i really fell in love with the like early they weren't early american films uh let me restate it they were my early experiences of american cinema and they happen to be movies from like the eight just because of my age you know movies from the 80s um or early 90s so things like ghost and beetlejuice and the adams family uh you know steel magnolias um big business <laughs> a lot of the whoopi goldberg movies like i said like karina karina and made in america and sisters act yeah a lot of those sort of lighter films um which i think i think it's something that i try to make a point to in the, in the in both films is the influence of american films on people outside of the states and how it's it kind of serves different purposes and like for us our lives were so rough you know we wanted that escape and so people sometimes make fun of hollywood and like happy endings and it's like cheesy and it is but also like there are people for whom that's like that's an escape and it's a salvation during really hard parts of their life. And that's an important service that those films have. Well, as a filmmaker, and particularly when it comes to this feature film, what are some of the influences? Who are some of the influences? Or what are some of the films that, that really rubbed off on you in your filmmaking style and that kind of led to, to the film that we received? Yeah, I think like one of the big influences is uh, Fassbender, German filmmaker. He made a lot of sort of social melodramas in Germany. And when I discovered his work in my like early 20s, what struck me is he would have a lot of uh, kind of still tableaus of characters, very theatrical. And that resonated with me because um, Partially, I love the look of it because my background is in painting and, you know, as a painter, I love those like sort of painterly compositions, but also um, as a like a low budget independent filmmaker, again, it uh, having things kind of happen at the tableau, it's you can still make it really beautiful, but you can control what it is and it's not as expensive, you know what I mean? Because like I can't afford to build a whole three dimensional set necessarily for every different environment in the story, but I can create a really beautiful two-dimensional world and just stay there with the character. So that's something that was a big influence for me, his work. Um, and then uh, Derek Jarman, who made really ambitious films in Britain, um, kind of, he would make this, you know, queer kind of period films like Edward II. And again, he was just really resourceful with how he used sets and costumes 
a lot of times, you know, again, you wouldn't see the entire environment. The environment would be contained. Um, and that was a way that he was able to tell these gay stories, really epic gay stories on a small budget. And that inspired me because it's like, I like being able to tell whatever story I want and not be limited by my budget. And I think if you do that, you have to kind of embrace the fact that you're making a movie and that, you know, <laughs> you, you can't actually go to Russia and build uh, an old apartment building, you know, as you would if you were like a million, multi-million dollar production. Speaking on the production and the release of the film, this did debut at South by Southwest Film Festival last year in 2021. And your previous documentary also went to South by Southwest and, and won a jury prize there. How is working the festival circuit and, you know, really navigating being a more independent filmmaker? Yeah, it takes, I mean, it takes kind of, Time, you know, I remember when I started making films, I couldn't get into, I submitted everywhere. I wouldn't get into any festivals. And, and now at this point, like I've made a lot of work and I, I feel like I've screened at every LGBT festival that there is. So it's, it's, it's a beautiful community of uh, you know, LGBT filmmakers around the world. And it's a small community. Like I feel like a lot of us know each other and I've gotten, you know, in the past few years, I've gotten to meet a lot of my peers, like, you know, filmmakers like Winnever Turner or Jim Fall who made Trick, you know, films that I saw as a high, in high school. <laughs> and I could tell those filmmakers like, hey, like, I wouldn't be able to do what I do if you, you know, without you. Um, so that that's really fun. You know, I love festival world because again, it's, it's, it's a community. A lot of the uh, people who work for festivals, work for multiple festivals. Everybody knows each other. It's sort of a, a, its own little family. Now we're getting a special release here, a special Blu-ray release of this film coming out on the 21st of June. During Pride Month seems fitting. <laughs> Ed, what does that road look like? We have the glitz and the glamour of these festivals. You're in, it's a South by Southwest, you know, one of the biggest film festivals in the U.S., certainly. And then there's oftentimes this lull for post-festivals. If you're not one of the, the big ones that gets, you know, snatched up for a couple million dollars, what does that process look like post-festival and finding your way to distribution? Yeah, for us, we were really lucky. We, um, after South By, we sold to Dark Star, who's our distributor. And Dark Star has been incredible for the film. They've put it out uh, in theaters. So we played in theaters earlier this year. I mean, it's a limited run, so it's not like in every Cineplex and every suburb, but um, I think it was nine or 10 cities that we played in. So that was really amazing. That's not something I ever, I ever even imagined would happen. Um, and then VOD and DVD, and now I'm really excited about this Vinegar Syndrome release because I've been a Vinegar Syndrome like mega fan for years. I love what they do. And so I was completely freaking out when I found out that they're partnering up with Dark Star on this release. Got a lot of really cool special features to them. Um, super excited about sharing. And where can people purchase it? Where can they seek it out and, and get this special edition Blu-ray? <laughs> So yes, yeah, special edition Blu-ray is only from vinegarsyndrome.com and it has like a limited slipcover thing edition. I don't know. I know a lot of people are into slipcovers. I... Yeah, <laughs> great. <laughs> well, it's gorgeous. The artist, um, it's funny because I didn't talk with the artist before she created the graphic, but I think she captured like the spirit of the film beautifully. And yeah, I'm just thrilled. So what is it that you're hoping audiences are able to get out of the film? Of course, we talked about just how unique your story is. Really, any immigrant LGBTQ story, particularly late 80s, early 90s, is, is quite the story of perseverance. <laughs> um, and then you add on top of that the stepfather, the mail-in bride, uh, it just gets a lot more interesting from there. But what is it that you're hoping audiences are able to get from your story? I think um, hope is what I really wanted to convey with this film is hope and believing that you can, you know, improve your life and your life will improve, especially for LGBT kids. Again, it's such a 
I think every kid feels like if you're in a hard place, like things will never improve because that's kind of the mindset of a child because they haven't had a lot of experiences. And I wish I could go back to my, you know, younger self and say, your life's going to be amazing. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so I want to convey that to other kids, uh, especially, you know, immigrant kids and if people see it in other countries where they have, you know, where gay people don't have it as many rights and just give them hope is what I want to do. Have you been back to Russia since uh, leaving? I would never. never. <laughs> <laughs> even, even less likely <laughs> nowadays, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I did love uh, reading up on, on part of why you were really pushing to kind of get these things out specifically. In recent years, uh, Russia has made <laughs> headlines with us, specifically within our community uh, for some not great reasons and not <laughs> so accepting laws and policies that have been brutally put into effect. I guess, thankfully, uh, we're in an age where that's blasted onto a worldwide view so everyone at least can see some of the, the monstrosities that have been happening and been overlooked and ignored. Other countries are also happening. I mean, it's not just Russia. There are other countries that are not tolerant and haven't on that kind of uh, publicity as well. You haven't, you haven't uh, seen grandma since, since leaving, huh? No, my grandma unfortunately passed away, but she did visit me um, and my partner years ago. And so it was, it, it was fun. It sort of, it changed a lot of her outlooks on life. You know, it, it, it was a beautiful kind of experience because she, um, a lot of sort of prejudices and things that she carried with her, um, she was able to overcome or work through. Did that color her depiction in the film a little bit? Because I felt as though watching her, obviously very old school in a lot of ways, there was still this almost kind of like warmth, almost this, this obviously humor. Really important to me, like when I talked to Leah, uh, said, you know, you know, she comes across kind of bigoted and tough and but I just want you to know that like my grandma loved us very much and I love my grandma very much and she's ultimately a good person uh, and, and Leah was like oh I totally see that like I see that in the script so I was like okay good because <laughs> I don't want to come across as a monster you know she is a little bit of a monster but also she's a, a beautiful human in her own way and so yeah that was important. And of course, Leah Delaria is fantastic and wonderful. <laughs> yeah, it was so fun to work with. I'm sure. And your mother obviously seems like an absolute gem of a human in both the documentary and then it's just kind of reinforced here in this film. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, my mom is pretty special. I'm very lucky. <laughs> and then I saw, unfortunately, your stepfather of sorts uh, <laughs> uh passed away recently how was your relationship moving on after you know the the marriage had come to a close we stayed in touch with her and we stayed friends we weren't super close because i i mean something that i had to um you know the film i like to say the film is 99 percent based on true events uh but there's things that you i had to omit from the film and one of the things is like my stepfather even after she came out was completely crazy <laughs> and i didn't want to go there because her characters are already complicated and i didn't want to also like portray a transgender person as crazy and so i really downplayed that side of her but you know the fact is when she came out and became a wiccan she also became like an oath keeper and like joined a crazy militia and like would do all this crazy stuff so we kind of kept her, you know, we, we stayed in her life, but we also like didn't have a lot in common. Um, but we were really lucky at the opportunity to like say goodbye to her when she passed away. Her daughter um, let us know and we got to like hold her hand and tell her how much she's, you know, we love her and she's done so much for us and we wouldn't be here without her. And so um, she's definitely a very important person in my life. Very troubled, <laughs> you know, very, very troubled. <laughs> She kind of deserves her own multi-season Netflix show, I think. <laughs>
story comes across really nice in this in the film though it's, it's a, another pretty relatable story i think for a lot of people particularly more commonly in previous generations of kind of that self-hate um that yeah. was taught to you and you know brought down upon you and then you kind of internalize that and then perpetuate that onto to other people um before somebody gives you some grace and hopefully you you're able to take it and <laughs> work yeah. through some of those issues at least <laughs> yeah yeah we're, we're, I'm, I'm really happy that she got to live out her you know the rest of her life as an older person you know being more true to herself now what was the actual vhs tape that inspired the one here in the film that you rented hundreds of times it, it really was the living end oh, you know okay. i just thought the cover was so hot that's why i remember it. i was just like the, hot, the cover is so sexy and i just kept yeah <laughs> it really took me many many you know like i show in the film like many many attempts to rent it because i would just be too scared to go to the lgbt section and be seen in its vicinity. <laughs> and where was the swimming teacher that we hear about in the documentary? Where where was he in this film? Oh my god, yeah. I initially he was in the script, and then I just you know with the feature, I just realized like I have to really simplify the story because there's already a lot, as you know, happening. So um I really you know simplified and a lot of those things didn't make it into the ultimate film, but I, I love him in the short. <laughs> I have one more question. Where did the nickname Potato come from, from your mom? <laughs> I mean, my mom had so many different nicknames for me, so I picked one for the film, and I just thought it was sort of, it's funny because it's like an ugly vegetable that's very resilient, you know? <laughs> it's like a vegetable that a lot of, like Ireland and Russia, you know, people would starve without potatoes, so it's like, this sort of hearty and not super attractive vegetable. And it's also, you know, vodka's made from it. So it's very Russian in a way. I don't know. Well, I thought the film was absolutely delightful. It really harkened back to a lot of queer staples within cinema. It has that air about it. And that's really Thanks. refreshing to see it, a modern day, 2021, 2022 release. The one that pays such homage in so many ways to the the classic of our of our little subgenre, because for so long we we have had to really scrap together whatever we can make and create this really imaginative, fun vision. And so much of the pain of our community has been, you know, delivered in this joyous way and and i think this really captured a spirit of that so thank you for creating it and i'm glad we all can experience it now it's still available to watch on vod it is still on vod it's also for people who don't have blu-ray the dvd is out and all the major you know like amazon and um <laughs> even Walmart. my friend was like i bought it on walmart i was like oh my god it's so weird <laughs> Perfect. So you have no excuses. But if you want to check out, and I highly recommend that you do, Potato Dreams of America, as we said, it is available on VOG across all of the major platforms to purchase the DVD and will be coming out for a special release on June 21st. Once again, thank you so much, Wes, for talking with me about the film. I really appreciate it. Did you have anything final that you wanted to say or plug? just yeah thank you so much for having me and i want to know who the redhead in the green dress is behind you miss jinx monsoon oh my gosh so <laughs> i don't know if you know um i created a, a series called capitol hill that jinx is the star of that as well oh yes you are seattle based as as is so, Ms. monsoon Capitol Hill just got picked up by Dark Star, our, the same distributor um, that has Potato, and they uh, will see where they release it. But I'm really excited because it's very, it's a very colorful. I like to describe it as sort of an Adult Swim cartoon, but live action, with a lot of drag queens and very colorful, kind of dark comedy with horror and melodrama in it. 
I'm kind of a tel telenovela. <laughs> Well, maybe we'll be talking again once we find out where Dark Star is able to distribute that because, you know, we might be talking to the queen of all queens here soon if, if she wins. It's all winter season of Drag Race, like I am rooting for her to do. So we'll, we'll see. Good. Well, thank you so much. And everyone, so. go purchase this film. <laughs>